In 1983, Ed Plout bought shares in a Kentucky horse farm called Spendthrift Farm Incorporated. In 1987, Plout and other investors sued Spendthrift Farm in federal court, accusing it of securities fraud under Section 10B of the Securities Exchange Act. At the time, there was no statute of limitations for federal securities fraud cases. As a result, courts borrowed state statutes of limitations and applied them in federal securities fraud cases. Plout's case was probably timely under Kentucky's three-year statute of limitations. But while Plout's case was pending, the United States Supreme Court decided Lamp, Pleva, Lipkind, Prupus, and Pettigrew v. Gilbertson in 1991. In Lamp, the United States Supreme Court ruled that all Section 10b securities fraud lawsuits had to be filed according to a uniform standard, which was within three years of the fraud and one year of its discovery. Plout's case wasn't timely under the limitations period established in Lampf. Because Lampf applied to all cases then pending, including Plout's case, the district court dismissed Plout's case with prejudice. Plout didn't appeal the dismissal, and the judgment became final. A few months later, the president signed the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation Improvement Act. Part of the act was meant to soften the harsh effects of the Lampf decision on plaintiffs like Plout. To that end, the Act amended the securities laws in what became Section 27A of the Securities Exchange Act. Subsection 27A-B required courts to reinstate those securities fraud cases that had been filed before the Lampf decision, but were then dismissed because of the new rule. Plout filed a motion to reopen his case, which had been dismissed under Lampf and was eligible for reinstatement. The district court determined that Plout's lawsuit qualified for reinstatement under the Act, but then ruled that subsection 27A-B was unconstitutional. The court therefore denied Plout's motion. The Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit affirmed the district court's decision. Plout then petitioned the United States Supreme Court for review. The Supreme Court granted cert to address whether Congress could enact legislation requiring the judicial branch to reopen closed cases and reconsider final judgments. Writing for the majority, Justice Scalia held that Congress could not pass retroactive legislation directing the judiciary to reopen final judgments because doing so violates the Constitution's separation of powers. Article 3 of the United States Constitution vests all judicial power in the courts, and only the courts may decide the outcome of individual cases. Therefore, when a court says that a judgment is final, it's final. If Congress tries to dictate the outcome of an individual case or to reopen a case after final judgment, Congress improperly intrudes on the judicial power. Before the Constitution was adopted, Scalia noted, colonial legislatures frequently overturned specific court decisions. In the Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison both criticized that kind of legislative interference with the judiciary. Abraham Lincoln also spoke against legislative interference with final judgments in his first inaugural address. The Constitution provides that Congress's proper function is to make general laws of prospective effect, while the judiciary's function is to apply those laws to individual cases and then decide them. Congress isn't permitted to interfere in the outcome of individual cases, nor can it force courts to reopen final judgments. Therefore, subsection 27A-B was an unconstitutional violation of the separation of powers principle. The Supreme Court affirmed the Sixth Circuit's judgment, holding section 27A-B unconstitutional and declining to reopen Plout's case. Justice Breyer concurred in judgment. Breyer agreed that subsection 27A-B violated the separation of powers because it was purely retroactive and singled out a small number of securities fraud plaintiffs for preferential treatment. Unlike the majority, however, Breyer left open the possibility that Congress could require the courts to reopen closed cases under some circumstances. Justice Stevens dissented, joined by Justice Ginsburg. Stevens argued that historical tradition and constitutional precedent allowed Congress to reopen final judgments, citing decisions from the 1830s to the 1980s. In this case, Congress didn't tell the courts how to rule in securities fraud cases, but merely restored cases that had been wrongly dismissed under the harsh Lampf rule. For Stevens, the Constitution's separation of powers meant that the branches of government must cooperate with each other rather than operate with strict independence. 
Plout v. Spendthrift Farm, Inc. is a significant statement on the Constitution's separation of powers, showing that Congress's Article I powers do not permit it to tamper with final judgments.